I met a lot of students who are on campus today and who spent time with you and who were ecstatic about the experience. What would you tell those young folks who are starting out in this industry? I mean, what, what was your advice to them? What, why, what did you say to them that so impressed them? They wanted to know the road to success. So I couldn't get out of flow. There's a lot of people in this audience who want to take notes. I gave them directions to get on the I-15. <laughs> and told them if they continue to ride the I-15, and they, they stop on the East Coast, if they haven't thought of an idea to be entrepreneurial, get another job. I told them they were very lucky to be at UNLV, that UNLV was, was one of the leading hotel schools in the world. You know, I, I, I have places in, uh, uh, it's known that we have properties in Macau and in Singapore. Yeah, I read in the paper this morning you had a real bad first quarter. Well, we're looking forward to the next quarter. Um, but I go to different parts of the world looking for opportunities. And uh, every place we go, they say, oh, well, we need something. We need a hotel school. Can you do anything to help bring a hotel school uh, to somewhere? I think originally the Singapore school was started with, uh, what's the fellow? Don, what's the fellow's name that used to head up the hotel school? Don? Uh, Stuart Mann. Right, yeah, Mann, yeah. right. I think I worked with him some time ago when we first got involved in Singapore about setting it up. Um, UNLV is part of my life because when I first met Mann, we sponsored a program for exchange students from Israel from the School of the Interdisciplinary Center, which is run by a good friend of Mary and mine. And, um, so we had students uh, coming into UNLV from Israel. We have students that have gone there, having graduated the Ad Adelson Educational Campus in, in Summerlin, and um, we employ graduates of the school. So some of our employees are, are UNLV graduates. So I seem to have a, a continuity with uh, in, in, and out. Let me, let me ask you a question that when we were here for G2E last year, Miriam took uh, Judy Patterson, who works with me at the Republican National Committee, uh, through your clinic here. I mean, you and Miriam are very involved in philanthropic work. Most people don't know uh, the real extent of your philanthropy. How important is it for companies in our industry, like Las Vegas Sands, to really play an active role in their community? First thing to do is to, is to pay attention to the needs of the employees. For instance, in our property, we were the first one in the entire state to have a daycare for children of employees. We set up a pack so we could, we could address uh, the needs of different uh, organizations and people throughout, uh, throughout the community. Um, I was brought up thinking that by a very poor man who left me very rich in values. And one of those values was to do philanthropy. Uh, my father made me promise that I would put money in the charity box every day. Now, I didn't keep that promise per se, but I make it up in bulk. <laughs> We were very poor, and my father put money, he was a cab driver, when he could get a job. He only had a sixth grade education. In Lithuania, not in where he came from, not here in the United States. Couldn't speak English when he got here. But he left me with this, with this belief that we were poor. And one day I asked him why I was putting the money into that charity box. He explained the whole thing to me and made me promise that I would do it every day in my life. And as I told you, I didn't keep the promise per se, but I did keep the promise in spirit. 
And, um, and I asked him why he did that. Because we were poor as well. After he explained to me, he does it for the poor people. He said, no matter who or what you are, there is always somebody or some, there's always someone more than you are. If you're poor, there's somebody more poor than you are. If you think you're smart, there's always somebody smarter than you. And I kept that value with me till today. My parents are gone, may they rest in peace for 25 years, 27 years now. And, uh, but I kept, that, I kept that value. So philanthropy is not, I, it's part way responsibility, but I see philanthropy not necessarily or solely as a responsibility. I see it as an honor. So to support the community is both a responsibility and an honor. So my wife, who's a specialist in, in chemical dependency that you and I call drug abuse, uh, has started three clinics, one in Israel, her country of her birth, one here in Vegas where we live, and she set one up, but it's run by the health ministry in, uh, in Macau. And now we're trying to set one up in, in Singapore to help out the drug addicts. We set up a, uh, a website to help teach your parents how to recognize signs of drug addiction in their children, the early signs. Uh, we sent a lot of kids to school on, uh, on, uh, to, to higher education on, on scholarships that we give both personally and in the company. So being part of the community is what you are, and therefore you have the responsibility and you feel the honor of participating and supporting the community. You know, Yes, please. Thank you. You know, thanks to the visionary leadership of people like you and Steve Wynn, who is here with Andrea tonight. And a friend of many of us, the late Mike Sloan remembers the late Terry Lanny, who we all loved at MGM. Our industry went global. Now let me ask you a question. I don't know whether I asked you this in Macau a year ago. What did you see in Macau 10 years ago that fundamentally made you say, this is where we've got to be. This is where the future is. A swamp <laughs> and a bay. It was all together. Uh, It is beside, it is part of the biggest country in the world whose reputation is that its citizens have a culture of challenging luck. I don't believe they gamble. I don't believe they're addicted. Just like you and I would go out with our wives for dinner, they love to go and challenge luck. And there's only a billion three hundred million of them. So I know it was marginal in terms of potential. <laughs> so, so I said that, uh, I said to myself, self, well, that's how I call myself. Self, this is an opportunity. It's a no-brainer opportunity. There's only 100 million people within like a two, two and a half hour car ride that was my Boston accent, I said car ride. It's only a two, two and a half hour car ride to the edge of Guangdong province. There's 100 million people that has more foreign direct investment than any other place in China that is really a business and export uh, province. We could lose. I would just, <laughs> that's what I saw and it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a question in my mind. What? And when I saw the swamp and the bay, I thought they, the, the, government, the governor, Stanley Ho, a fellow by the name of Stanley Ho, had a monopoly for 40 years. And so we didn't know how to get land. So we went around looking for land on what was, and what is known today as the peninsula. But the land we got would only hold one property, and my idea was to replicate Las Vegas. 
I didn't see any reason why if we just copied the success of Las Vegas, we couldn't replicate the success in Asia. As a matter of fact, my opinion is there is room for five to 10 Las Vegas style strips with about 25 or 30 mega resorts before the phrase integrated resort came in throughout Asia. If you put up five or 10 with 150,000 rooms each, they'd still succeed. How did and you still wouldn't saturate the market. How did Singapore differ? Because for those of you in this room who have not been to Singapore and seen Marina Bay Sands, it's, it, it blows your mind. But that was a very different experience because of the integrated resort com, uh, concept. Uh, how was it, was it different going in there? Well, that wasn't our first integrated resort. Our first integrated resort is what we're sitting in tonight. Yeah, that's true. The integrated resort was a phrase that they developed and I plagiarized it. <laughs> but they took the formula for it, which I had discovered before. And if you look at the components that we have in this property, and I discussed that this afternoon about putting in what's known the term of art in Asia is for conventions, convention related industry, is mice. Meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. And there's mice here. I said this afternoon, if you're gonna build a new hotel, focus on mice. Tell and them what mice very means. Nice. So some people maybe doesn't know. I what said that, meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. It's an acronym for those, for those things. And that's only part of it. That's only what we're sitting in here. We're sitting in two rooms. We have, in this property, 330 of these rooms. 330. Now, these are a little, couple of the larger rooms. If you're looking, I'm looking up in the ceiling because the way we designed it, there's one chandelier in each room. So we're looking at two, so only two of these rooms. But we're in the larger ballroom. Uh, there are two ballrooms here that are the largest column-free ballrooms in the world. So the integrated resort really came about, we have the shopping, we have the theatrical showrooms with live entertainment. Uh, we don't have a, uh, an arena. I wish we had room for an arena, I'd put one in. Uh, but it has the spas, it has the celebrity chef restaurants, it has casual and fine dining. It's got the showrooms, it's got the hotels, it's got the MySpace. Oh, I forgot, we have a casino. <laughs> now, it's what happens when you get older. <laughs> you and Steve uh, have led the, the movement to Asia. Where are we here in the States? What, what do you see happening in Las Vegas in the future? We've been through some rough times. It's good to see the numbers are starting to rise again. Elsewhere in the U.S., been a lot of talk. Uh, I mean, uh, later this week, I'm speaking to the new Massachusetts Gaming Commission. They've asked me to come up and be their keynote speaker uh, for their first uh, open-air conference with the people, folks. A lot of activity in Miami. Uh, what, do you, what do you see happening in the next few years in the state? Well, it all depends upon the business model of, of any of the operators. Steve has uh, one business model which is very successful and he does great at it. I have another different model and hopefully we do great. And if yesterday's earnings report was an indicator, we're getting there. You're getting by. <laughs> we're getting by. But. My belief is that the integrated resort model has to be enhanced and improved here in Las Vegas because our audience, which are grown-ups, we're not looking, I don't, I don't want to misuse the word adult, we're not looking for adult experience per se. In a colloquial sense, we're looking for grown-ups entertainment. And for grown-up entertainment, we need to get more integrated resorts that have all the components, the amenities, of, of which an integrated resort is comprised. And we reproduced that in, in Macau with the Venetian Macau. We reproduced that in, uh, in Singapore. So happens the building, we lucked out with, with an extraordinary looking building that people call the eighth wonder of the world. And uh, we've even had people climb up the side of the building. When we opened it, people without ropes, without safety ropes, 
but they had suction cups or whatever in hand, and they climbed up the building. There was like, this was the forerunner to Spider-Man. <laughs> so they gave me a Spider-Man costume. Have you worn it? Uh, they gave me a small, I need an extra large. <laughs> So that, to me, is the business model. If I have a business model of integrated resort, it costs a lot of money to put up each of the components. And if we can see an increased profitability coming out of those remote, the different uh, field operations, then we'd rather be in the, in the international market because our business model calls for um, uh, many components that end up costing a lot of money. I can't imagine when Steve spent 2.7 billion, I mean, I thought that was the largest amount of money that anybody would ever spend on a property. He spent it good and it's, it's paying off, but to, to follow my business model, I'm gonna spend today somewhere between three to six billion each property. So to go into Massachusetts, spend a half a billion or a billion, the amount of money they were making, our investors and the analysts in the industry will criticize me for going after somebody else's market. Caesars does a very good job at the riverboat, individual commercial casino all around the country. So people can earn 100, 150 million, or 25, 50 at the low end, up to 100, 150, I think, at the higher end. They do a very good job at that. So I believe that the United States is starting to get a little more diluted in terms of potential market. The radius in which a property can operate is shrinking and shrinking. And your market is equidistant between you and your neighbor in terms of equidistant in terms of travel time and not, not travel distance. So I guess like in Massachusetts, there's gonna be nine, 10, or 11 within, within 100 miles of Boston. So Steve has a, a, better, a better business model to go after the high roller than we do, and he can make more money in a, in a casino in Massachusetts than we can, because, uh, I don't know, maybe we can't do it as good as him, but our business model requires that we spend a lot more money to build all these, these extra components. Well, I see Dean Snyder has arisen to our left, but I'm gonna ask you one more question. Sure. Uh, you and I were on stage in Macau about a year ago when you were given an honor, and uh, a few months ago here in Las Vegas where you were inducted in the Hall of Fame. Uh, what motivates you to keep working as hard as you still are. You know, that's an interesting question. A lot of people don't seem to get it. It, have, it goes back to the time when I discovered that I was something called an entrepreneur. Until I was 32, I thought I couldn't hold down a job. I gave a talk at Babson uh, College, a business school in Boston, to something called the Entrepreneurial Exchange. And I asked the people, there were about 300 kids in the audience, and I said, how many of you think you're entrepreneurs? And everybody raised their hand. And then I asked them, I said, how many of you are in the entrepreneur business or want to be in the entrepreneur business for money? Nobody has ever guessed how many people raised their hand. Too many people to guess here, so I'll tell you, one. That is the answer to the question. What is the reason why people want to be entrepreneurial? My answer is the sense of achievement to accomplish something. It's not the money. Now, I'm not gonna send the money back. <laughs> <laughs> I can do good things with the money. I have a couple of gentlemen here that, that run our Medical Research Foundation. Uh, we have a gentleman here who runs our PAC for, uh, for uh, not political, but our, uh, whatever we call it. What do we call it, Ron? We call it something. Foundation. Foundation. For the company to give our money for, to be part of the community. 
So um, the money does a lot of good, and uh, particularly in our Medical Research Foundation. Um, one of our scientists found the gene to the optic nerve and re-innovated sight in mice. So I asked him if my sight started to go bad, would I qualify because I'm a rat? <laughs> I'm not a little mice, I don't squeak. I said, can you solve the problem? But I don't have the problem. So anyway, um, that too is very gratifying. And it's, I think it's a sense of accomplishment that keeps a guy like me going. Ladies and gentlemen, our honoree this evening, Mr. Sheldon Adelson. I mentioned before that uh, I saw I, I saw this act. This is not an act. This is the real thing. But I saw this uh, in, in in Macau a year ago, and, and I took away so much from that. I saw an audience take away a tremendous amount uh, uh, from that. And so I'm glad that we had a chance to do that uh, tonight. I also want uh, to say that uh, I appreciate uh, Frank uh, highlighting the fact that Steve uh, Wynn is here. Uh, that's one thing that I've always. One thing that has always impressed me about this industry uh, is the ability for uh, uh, competitors to get together uh, when it really is important. Uh, and to have the two people in our industry that have been the most significant change agents uh, in the history of our industry together, sitting at the same table, uh, sharing dinner and sharing conversation, is a big deal. And it says a tremendous amount about the individuals and about the industry. Now, in, in terms of this, uh, this honor that uh, we're presenting to you, Sheldon, tonight, uh, this is a bit different than we've done in the past. In the past, we've had a number of honorees that recognize different parts of the industry. We said tonight we're going to do something different. We're going to take the integrated resort concept and say that we want, to, we want to identify somebody that has done more in delivering the concept of an integrated resort to the world. Uh, we want to take that person and honor him in an integrated way. So we have one person that we are honoring tonight as the industry leader uh, of the year, the hospi hospitality industry leader of the year. What you have done, Sheldon, is, is nothing short uh, of a miracle. For those of you that have not been to Macau, you have to see Macau. For those of you that have not been to Singapore, you have to see it. It, it is absolutely incredible uh, what has been done, and it speaks to the power of the individual and the entrepreneurial spirit that you've heard about uh, uh, here tonight. But it also speaks uh, to the concept uh, of change, uh, taking a different path uh, and making, uh, making a real difference uh, in the world. So, Sheldon, uh, you are somebody very special. It is our honor uh, to be able to stand here and present you this award tonight. Sheldon Nettleson. Thank you, Don. For those of you who can't remember, I first met Don Snyder about 20, 25 years ago when he was a banker. I didn't succeed in borrowing any money from him. All he wanted was deposits. <laughs> and he talks about uh, uh, change, telling me about change. I change my belt size more often than I change my socks. <laughs> I understand a little bit about change. And um, Steve Wynn uh, has brought change to this community. I think in a way that most people didn't. I remember a guy who was competing for your bid, I forget his name, he was partners with a woman in a construction company. Kitty, I think her name was. Rodman. Kitty Rodman. Rodman, yeah. I forget, what was her partner's name? A guy? Who? Gus Rapone. Gus Rapone. Oh, I'm not sure of that. But anyway. <laughs> he said, to, <laughs> I just. Steve, when you get to be my age, you'll remember, you'll come to realize that the memory is the first thing to go. <laughs> or is it the second? <laughs> he, 
He said, let's say, assume it was Gus. Gus said, can you imagine that guy? He's building his front desk a thousand feet from, from the street. I said, he must have something in his mind that he knows is going to work. And it worked. And uh, I, I, um, I want to say that Steve is fantastic at, at creating a mystique about his product. When he opened in Macau, I thought it was a different, uh, it was a different thing, but little did I realize that it was right on the mark exactly where he established his mark, where he could do the best. And that's the, the high roller. You know, I remember when I first came to Vegas 20 some odd years ago, about 24 years ago, and uh, we were talking to the people at the Sands, and we're asking how many high rollers are there in the world? And there was an over and under bet at about 150. Steve, you and I have 150 high rollers in one week. <laughs> And uh, in, in China, nobody ever, you can't imagine how the gaming industry is practiced over there in Asia. Um, it's just phenomenal. And I think that, I want to thank you, Don. I want to thank the administration, the staff, and the faculty for this honor. You know, I, I have been in, in dozens of businesses in my lifetime, and, and it is, I haven't got that many honors in a lot of the things I've done. Uh, haven't failed, but this industry is, is very good to me. It has honored me in a number of different ways and places and practices. And I appreciate it and I very, very much respect the, the commitment to this industry at UNLV. I've heard of it from other people. You talk to people who go to Michigan or go to Cornell, and everybody says, oh, UNLV is third. And you talk to people at UNLV who get the education, they say, no, we're not. They're third. We're first. So there is a passion that emanates from, from UNLV. I appreciate that passion because I put passion into everything I do. And uh, I remember Man, what was his first name? Stuart, Stuart Man. Uh, when I first met him, he was so passionate that he convinced Mary and I to, to use our friendship with the people over there to accomplish what he, in Israel, to bring students over here to accomplish what he wanted. And everywhere I go, as I started to say before, everybody asks about possibility of getting a UNLV school in their country. And uh, uh, Don just said he'd rather bring the students here rather than open the schools a lot of other places. Very good move. I'm glad you're not my competitor, Don. <laughs> but why didn't you give me the money 25 years ago? <laughs> Can you help a guy out? <laughs> Can you change a billion? <laughs> well, I want to thank all of you for giving me this honor, for showing your appreciation and standing up. And uh, it does make me feel very warm and, and appreciated. And I, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. And I want to congratulate the university on the great work that it does. I didn't realize we're up to over 30,000 students. Yeah, almost 30,000 students at UNLV, 28,000. 28,000. But who's coming? <laughs> uh, Frank, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Whether or not, I, thought, I thought it was Greta Van Susteren's show. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, I consider her one of the best. She's pretty good. She's pretty no, good. No, she's very good. Um, but then again, any, any, any of the uh, bobbin heads on Fox are very good. I figured you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me thank you all again. Let me thank the school again for this great honor. I also want to congratulate Paula Eli. A very, very impressive presentation, a very impressive background. Thank you, Paula.